If I was to ask you guys which carburetor had a race ready tune in it, which one do you think it would be? The answer may surprise you. Welcome to the Night Club, guys. It's your host, the Night Wrencher. I've been trying to get back into the my normal habit of making carburetor videos, and recently I actually went out and I did a little bit of a street tune on a late 70s Firebird. Uh, it was a really fun video to do. Really nice guy. It was really awesome. Uh, but I, afterward, I did get a couple questions, mainly uh, what I actually classify as a street tune and what I classify as a race tune. And the big deal with that is they assumed that because I was tuning a Holly and I was doing all these different things to it that I was getting it ready to run at the track etc etc and that couldn't be farther from the truth a little while ago I asked you guys which carburetor you guys thought was set up with a race tune but in reality neither of these carburetors are ready to see any kind of track time because we don't even know what engine they're supposed to be on we have people buying two three four five six hundred dollar carburetors off the shelf putting them on their engines expecting them to go and they start running into issues starvation issues running lean running rich popping issues won't idle and it's not because they chose the wrong carburetor for their engine cfm wise but it's because they didn't actually tune it for their particular application people think that the only tuning you got to do to your carburetor are these two screws on the side and you set up the fast idle right here and you're done and you couldn't be further from the truth each carburetor that leaves a factory or did used to leave the factory back in the day those engines were set up with carburetors that were perfectly tuned for their application you had carburetors that would run in the summer in the fall in the winter in the spring with zero issues zero problems obviously later on we started getting with ethanol fuel we got it we started getting boiling in the fuel rails etc etc the problems started coming in but the fact of the matter is that these OEMs spent millions setting up their carburetors for their particular engines. But then after these manufacturers went ahead and set them up, us enthusiasts, we take off those cast iron intake manifolds. We put on a set of long tube headers. We put a cam in it and we put the same carburetor on and it may continue to run well, but oftentimes it does not. The calibration for your carburetor is now so far off, you're going to have to retune it for your current application. And there's two basic ways to get your tuning done on your carburetor. The first one is a street tune, and the second one is a race tune. I don't think a lot of people call it that, but I'm just going to use that very obscure designation for now. There are a few differences between a street tune and a race tune. You got to remember that when you are racing professionally or unprofessionally on the street or whatever, if you have a dedicated race car, you are looking for consistency on every pass. If you run 10.12 uh, on your first pass, you want to get close to 10.12 or 10.09 or 10.15. You know, you want to you want to run the same pass over and over and over again. So you try to simplify and eliminate as many variables as possible versus a let's say a street carburetor that you wanted to run on a variety of different situations it can accept different environments for you to be able to drive normally when talking about specifically about jetting a standard street carburetor will have asymmetrical jets the primaries will probably be either larger or smaller than the secondaries very rarely are they ever the same and the reason for that is because we have something called a power valve the power valve is the power enrichment circuit of the carburetor. Basically what it does is when it's under a heavy amount of load, vacuum drops to a certain amount, the power valve opens up, gives you a little bit of extra fuel, and allows you to continue powering through the, the power band. This device allows you to run leaner jets in the primary circuit, and it helps you with hot starts, it runs cleaner, it makes you waste less gas, more fuel economical, because you can run a leaner jet, and then when you need the power, when you haven't gone into the secondaries yet, let's say you're going on an on-ramp or something, trying to pass a car, and you put the throttle a little bit further, and you open this up, now you don't have to worry about any kind of detonation or melting your pistons because the power valve is giving you that extra fuel that you need for your engine to run well. On a race application, most people eliminate the power valve. And the reason for that is because when you're racing and you're looking for that consistency, you don't want to have to worry about when you're doing your launch or when you're setting up your car that your foot might be slightly off and your power valve will either stay open or it'll be closed and thus your air fuel ratio moves a little bit 
and thus you're not going to get that very consistent start because if you take off lean you're going to take off slow if you take off too rich you're going to take off slow so typically professional racers tend to eliminate the power valve altogether and not only that the asymmetrical jets that i was talking about earlier actually get replaced and they tend to have the same jets front to back or they're within a number or two and the reason for that is when you are running on the track and you are at wide open throttle wide open throttle means wide open throttle that means on a holly carburetor all four barrels are open and because all four barrels are the same size they're going to flow the same amount of air if they flow the same amount of air they have to flow the same amount of fuel because you no longer have a power valve you have to compensate the front in order to catch up to the rear but you also have to make sure that the rears and front jets are comparable to each other so that way you get even burn on all four corners you don't want to have lean jets on one corner you don't want to have lean jets on one side because half the motor is going to run good and the other half is going to run bad versus a street carburetor where you have maybe a dual plane intake maybe the left side will want more fuel than the right side maybe the right side will want more fuel than the left side maybe the primaries want more fuel than the secondaries maybe the secondaries want more fuel than the primaries and the list goes on and on when you are doing your street tune instead of trying to get all four corners exactly equal first you're going to go ahead and set up your transition aka your ifrs the next thing you're going to go ahead and set up your main jets you're going to go ahead and set up your timing you're going to go ahead and set up your power valve then you're going to set up your secondary transition your secondary jets, you're also gonna set up your idle, and you're gonna work through all these different circuits because it's a balancing act for street cars. You, the ideal situation for any kind of carbureted street car is you wanna go as lean as possible without affecting the drivability of your car. If we're talking about air fuel ratio, you wanna keep it as close to 14 and a half as possible without it going too lean to the point where you start damaging your engine race cars however want to get closer to about 12 and a half 12 even 11 and a half to one at wide open throttle because that's what makes the most power but it's also safer for the engine to run more fuel at a higher rpm on a street application you'll set up each circuit individually and you're going to make sure that you can stay as close to 14 and a half as possible and only go down to the low 13s high 12s when you're stomping on it when you're getting on the freeway or when you're doing some spirited driving but as soon as you're done you want to go right back to that lean spot where you were before and it doesn't matter if you're running a double pumper it doesn't run, matter if you're running a vacuum secondary carburetor you can use either of those for racing but but typically you'll want a vacuum secondary for a street car and a double pumper style carburetor for a race car and the reason for that is like i mentioned before a mechanical secondary carburetor doesn't matter where your foot is it's always going to be at the spot that you want it to be versus a vacuum secondary carburetor if your foot is too far in your secondaries might be open a little too far if your foot is a little bit too far out your secondaries might not be open enough and it's much harder getting that balance right on a vacuum secondary carburetor versus a mechanical secondary carburetor but that doesn't mean it's not doable it just means it's a little bit more difficult and if you're trying to set up a vacuum secondary carburetor on a street engine it is so much easier because as you're driving the different places where you have your foot it tends to run a little bit different but it self compensates because of the way the vacuum is applying itself to the vacuum secondary diaphragm if you have a really radical cam or if you're not producing any kind of vacuum the vacuum secondary system doesn't seem to work as appropriately but that's when you start switching over to the mechanical secondary carburetors booster design also has a big part in getting that fuel atomization but it's not so detrimental to the point that if you see a straight leg booster and a down leg booster that you're going to assume one is a dramatic difference over the other sure it plays a difference but it's not to the point where one not having something or having it uh, will determine the outcome of the race especially on a street driven vehicle usually it's everything below that and then the cherry on top would probably be the booster design the air bleeds and things like that. There are plenty of videos on YouTube showing you guys how to modify the main bodies of your carburetor so that way from the outside looking in, you can't actually tell that these carburetors have been modified at all. 
If you guys look right here, you've got adjustable bleeds. And if you guys look over here, these are just completely stock and normal. Professionals will actually put their adjustable air bleeds right here behind the metering block. And the reason for that is number one, uh, it's less suspicious because no one's going to be opening up your carburetor right before a race. And number two, if you're swapping out main jets or IFRs or whatever, you have access to these anyway and you can change them out for the front versus trying to change them out from the top when you're in the middle of a race and you accidentally drop something inside. You definitely don't want to do that. So a lot of people are actually doing it on the sides right here. The second thing they're doing when they're doing a race carburetor, they're actually blocking off their power valve. Uh, for the same reasons that I mentioned before, that they want that consistency when they're running. Third thing that a lot of people tend to do is remove the choke plate. Although some people go as far as removing the whole tower, usually race-ready carburetors, they don't run a choke at all because they start their cars up ready to go and they're coming in hot. They don't need any kind of assistance from a choke. They're not worried about driving in the snow. They're not worried about doing any kind of cold starts. They want to go in and they want to go and they don't want any kind of restrictions in front of their uh, booster venturis because that's going to disrupt the flow of their engines. If you guys have watched any kind of Richard Holdner for any specific amount of time, you guys are going to realize that a lot of times he gets a carburetor, puts it on the engine, his test engine, rejets the carburetor, and then he just hits it. And then he gets his power band and then he's good to go. When people on the internet grab brand new carburetors, slap them on and rejet them, just like Richard Holdner does, it gives people a false sense of security, thinking that if they grab a carburetor and they buy a jet kit, they can redo the jets and they're going to be perfectly set up for their application. I have several different videos showing you guys how to tune individual circuits on these carburetors. And the reason for those videos is because because setting up your engine to run a dyno pool is much more similar to running it on the racetrack than it is running it for a street car. On a race engine, you can set up your carburetor ignoring so many different circuits and you just worried about the wide open throttle performance. As long as when you stab the throttle and you hit the dyno, if it makes a clean pass at the right AFR, Everything else does not matter. Versus on a street car, you're in stop and go traffic, you're getting on the highway, you're keeping, you're maintaining speed, you're trying to pass somebody, you're working through all these different circuits and all these different circuits are supposed to work together in order for your car to run well. Will it necessarily run well at the track? Uh, sometimes, but usually the AFRs are a little bit too lean for you to reliably keep running the same pass over and over again. Are there people that run it like as is, they tune their carburetors on the street and then run it on the track? Of course there are. Especially if you set it up closer to a richer tune, that gives you enough breathing room for when you stab the throttle, you're going to be in a safe spot going down the track. I could go on and on and on about all the differences between a street carburetor and a race carburetor, but you'd be here for hours and hours and hours. So I'm going to post some more videos soon going in depth about all the things that I talked about today. I will see you guys all in the next one. Night Wrencher out.